Hi guys, it's Blackie from Shaman's Forge Woodscraft. Okay, today I would like to answer a question, or actually respond to uh, several of my viewers. Recently, William Collins posted a video about batoning, and he was talking about how um, batoning is not a good idea for a knife, and he went into some details about why. And I had several people, knowing I use WC knives, uh, started asking me questions. So. Here is my input on the whole batoning thing. Batoning, in my opinion, was rarely used back in the day. Uh, I think it's a fairly modern take on how to use it. You were only batoning when you weren't carrying a knife or something, a hatchet or something bigger to split wood or chop wood. And it was when those things where I didn't have anything else. You saw it a lot in combat in World War II, but the guys were using bayonets. And that's all they had, you know, to cut with, to beat it through a tree and small trees and make shelters and, and things like that. The Army issued axes and stuff like that, but only somebody riding on the truck or setting up a permanent area is going to carry one of those things, unless you were in the engineers or something like that. So, batoning, the act of beating a knife through a piece of wood, is not a good idea. And here's where I base that on. As I've said many times, steel is by is more elastic than rubber. It flex is. And you get a high enough speed camera, you actually get to see it flex. Now when I take a knife, and let's start with a thin knife, plain old old hickory butcher knife. Everybody knows what these are. The knife it's fairly wide, but it is very narrow. Now what that means is, imagine it like layers stacked up. So this way, it has a lot of strength. This way, it doesn't have a lot of strength. So I can chop with this, and that when I hit, that shock wave is spread all along the length. So it acts like a spring. It can take the shock. But if I do it this way, I have much less depth for those fibers to take it. So side to side pressure is what causes it to break. So if I take, say, this knife and I chop with it, that shock wave is spread out and absorbed. But when I go to baton, I'm not allowing that shock wave to be spread evenly through the blade. Because when I get up there and I start going down, okay, let me grab a piece. I take a piece of wood and I put it up there and I start batoning it. Now you see how relatively narrow versus the length of that blade. When I put it up here and I go to hit it, I'm gonna hit it right here in the middle to get it started. But once the blade gets down in it, I can't hit it in the middle anymore. Now I've gotta hit it out here on this end. And I'm going to hit, and that blade is going to flex. And that shock wave is going to run through that, and it's going to hit where it's bound up in the wood right there. And it, uh -uh, it resists it. And so rather than that wave coming into the seashore running all the way back to the handle, it doesn't. It stops here. Usually about that inch or so from the handle. So when I start beating on it and beating on it and beating on it, that shock wave runs back to there. And those fibers in that part of the steel, imagine it like long strands of spaghetti. If you take spaghetti and you start rocking it up and down, it starts cracking the individual pieces. Not all of them at once, but it pop, 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 and suddenly they're in two pieces. That's how steel fibers work as well. Remember, they're elastic, and they're under tension inside of a piece of steel. Well, when I start flex, 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 they snap internally or crack. And when enough of them have cracked in a given area, it goes pop, and like a rubber band snapping, the steel just runs and snaps in half. Now, you've seen rubber bands snap. You've seen spaghetti break. So that's the mindset I want you to have. When I'm hitting on that knife blade up here, I'm making that shock wave come right here. And usually when you see a knife broken, it's somewhere along the handle or up here close. 
Not up here where you're hitting it usually, although it can. But a thin blade like that, how much strength do you think that blade has edge on? Like this. How much strength do you think that? Think I could put a lot of power to it to try to make it force it through there? Of course. How much do you think that has? If I start bearing down, you see it already bends. Well, if I take any metal, no matter what the steel is, and start going flex, 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 it snaps off. I compressed those fibers and made those rubber band-like internal fibers start snapping. And then with no warning, pop. It goes in half. Now this is true not just of Old Hickory Butcher Knife, but any knife. When I was a boy, I remember a short story. Back in the days before internet, when dinosaurs ruled the world, we used to read. And I remember reading a collection of short stories, but the one that sticks out in my mind that kind of relates to this was about this necklace. And this necklace had been created by an evil person. And this necklace granted you a small wish. But eventually, it would betray you. So in the story, this young man whose sister has been captured by this evil tyrant for nefarious reasons, and there's no one that'll help and etc., he goes and gets the necklace. And with the necklace, he is able to free his sister, get money from the uh, treasury because he'll come up to a door and he goes I wish the door was unlocked and the door would be magically unlocked I wish the guard would walk away and not come back and the guard would walk away and he's able to free his sister he's able to get money out of the treasury and him and his sister leave and go off to some other land where he prospers for many years and he's a king in his own right and then one day he decides to do something good for all of his people and he goes and gets the amulet and he says I wish everyone in my kingdom lived a long and happy life. And the amulet betrayed him at that moment, and poof, he disappeared. And the necklace fell to the ground. Even though he had had good intentions, even though he only used it for good, the necklace betrayed him in the end. It's sort of like Russian roulette. Every time you baton that piece of steel, you're inflicting something inside that you can't see. And it may be it may be time five times, fifty times, five hundred times, five thousand times. But sooner or later, it's gonna betray you and go pop. Now, are there better choices than others? Of course. And I know you're gonna ask Blackie, will my can I baton my knife? You can baton anything. But for how long? Now, if you can answer this question, how thick is the steel? How wide is the steel? What is the steel made of? What is the heat treat of the steel? What is the hardness of the, the wood you're chopping? How hard are you hitting? At what angle are you hitting? At what angle is it going in? I'm sure that some of those people that do heavy mathematics can crunch all them numbers and give you a percentage of one out of so many hundred times or five thousand times or whatever. But the truth is you don't know. There are no numbers on the side of this that say you can baton it 300 times when 301 is going to snap in half. You don't know. So, I use mine very, very sparingly. Now, are there knives that are a better choice? Yes. It's, is it really good steel? Is it really well heat treated? Are you not beating it through really hard wood? Are you just kind of tapping it through? Or are you having to waylay on it? Those are the factors that can change it radically. Because this knife that you have, that you love, that you paid a lot of money for, it may baton beautifully through the gnarliest, nastiest stuff you've ever seen. 500 times you have showed it off. It is unbreakable. And then on 501, you got two pieces. You don't know what's going on inside. Now, for a knife that I would feel better about batoning, this knife. That's a cold steel SRK, carbon five, from the 1990s. 
I buried some stuff in the 1990s and recently dug it up. And this knife is very thick across the spine. It has a very thick cross section even down to the edge. This knife came in second back in the 90s where the U.S. Navy was kind of unofficially looking for another knife. And it came in second versus another knife. And when they were doing the test and they'd done all the scientific stuff, they decided to have some fun with it and they took one half inch of the blade up here and clamped it in a vise really, really hard. So it was hanging like that. And then they put up a sign for all the Marines and all the sailors that were on the base and said, if you can break it, you got your bar tab paid for the next two months. Well, those guys were motivated and they grabbed it and they yanked on it and they jerked on it and they bounced on it and they stood on it and they twisted on it and they did everything they could to this knife and the other knife that were running neck and neck. And the cold steel finally broke, not in the blade, back here in the handle. Up under that Criton handle there was some knurling in the, the tang of the knife to make the handle stick better. That's where it broke. And that's the reason it came in second. When you got several hundred Marines trying for several days to break it and they couldn't, yeah, that'd be a good knife for baton. But it's not that good a knife for buckskinning, uh, excuse me, for bushcraft. It's kind of blunt. It's kind of hard to work because of the angle. It's designed for toughness and durability and not for ergonomics. So if I was going to pick one to be a baton knife, I'd pick this. Because I know it's background, I know what it's made out of, and I know that it's meant more for the tough end than the actual carving end. Now, between it and the old hickory knife, which one would I want to carry as a woods knife? The old hickory. Yes, it's thin. Yes, it's more fragile. But I know what its capabilities are, and as a carving knife, bushcraft knife, this is better than this. This is a better survival knife pry the engine block out of the truck knife. This is a better real world, that knife. But for batoning, that's the better knife. It's because of what it's made of, how tough is it, how thick is it, and etc. And even then, this will break. Sooner or later, it's gonna betray you. But when? You don't know. So my advice is, understand that your knife will baton. Especially when we start talking about, you know, I was showing this. What if you got something like this? Where only you guys that quarter inch of a tip out there. Well, now when you're way laying on it, you're really putting that shock wave right there. And you're accelerating it. Sooner or later, it's going to betray you. Sooner or later, it's going to break. You've invested a lot of time and money in that knife. I don't want you to break it. So that's the reason I don't recommend batoning. Can it be done? Yes. That's my two cents worth, guys. It's your knife. You do what you want. And don't just take my word for it. Uh, find one like the Pathfinder instructors up at Dave Canterbury School or the guys at the Woods Runner School in the Carolinas or uh, Cold Cracker Bushcraft or several of these other big name things and just ask the, you know, the instructors How often in your schools does someone break a knife batoning? Because these are all kinds of knives and all kinds of people with all kinds of skill level. How often does a knife break? They'll be a real out when they tell you how many knives break at them schools and they got to, you know, have another knife and back up or here you can use this one because even really high quality knives will break. Any knife will break. Well, this has been long and rambling enough, but that's my two cents worth, guys. Hope it gives you some ideas. Please leave any questions or comments below, and as always, thank you so much for supporting my channel. Till next time, I'm Blackie for Shaman's Forge Woodscraft. Wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day, guys.